Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast, a Canadian real estate podcast that shows you how to pay off your mortgage sooner and live well while doing it. Now, here's your host, Sean Cooper. Welcome to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. I'm Sean Cooper, and it's great to be back for another episode. On today's show, I'll be talking to Chantel Chapman. Chantel is a millennial money and credit expert with a background in the mortgage industry. She was a mortgage broker for over a decade and has been teaching financial literacy for 10 years. Chantel is the founder of WT Finances, financial literacy and advice for millennials looking to get their money right. WT Finances is backed by science-based research in addiction and behavior to explore how consumerism and mental health are linked to money problems. In my interview with Chantel, we discuss the five main factors that affect your credit score, some common misconceptions about credit scores, and the best tips for improving your credit score. But before we get to my interview with Chantel, I'd just like to mention that this is the 50th episode of the Burn Your Mortgage podcast. I'd just like to take a moment to thank you listeners for tuning in to my podcast. I couldn't have reached 50 episodes without your support. I look forward to recording another 50 episodes with a slew of interesting guests with unique and inspiring real estate stories to tell. So be sure to tune in and encourage your family and friends to tune in as well. Now back to our regularly scheduled podcast episode. Without further ado, here's my interview with Chantel Chapman. Hi Chantel, how are you doing today? Good, how are you? Good, thanks. It's wonderful to have you back on the podcast. I can't think of a better way to have the 50th episode than to have you back as a guest since you were the very first guest on the podcast. So it's uh, wonderful to speak with you again. Oh, thanks, Sean. Yeah, it's coming full circle, and I'm excited to be here, too. Great. Well, why don't we just start by talking about credit, because some people may have heard that they need a good credit score, but they don't really understand what it is. So, Chantel, can you tell me in your own words, what is credit and why does it matter? Well, the word credit itself has multiple definitions, but in this case, we're talking about credit from the lens of our finances. And we say that credit, credit history or credit report or credit score, these basically are your like adult report card. So what the credit report does or your credit history does is it tracks your dealings with previous money that you've borrowed in the past and it looks at the the past history and also the present moment where you're at and it calculates a score based on your dealings with credit. Perfect. And as you mentioned some of the parts there, my understanding is that there are three parts of credit, your credit history, your credit report, and your credit score. Perhaps you could just talk a bit about how those all work together. Yeah, for sure. So your credit report is the document that houses your credit history. And your credit history is based on, like I said, the way that you've handled credit in the past and even in the present moment. And basically that's taken and that's put into an algorithm. And what the algorithm is doing is it's going to pop out a score and that's called the credit score. And that credit score is really predicting how you're going to behave in the future based on your present and past. Your credit reports like your report card, your credit score is like your grade. That's an interesting way to look at it as. And also, can you talk a bit about the two credit reporting agencies as well? Because people kind of talk about their credit score as if it's one and the same, but there are two credit reporting agencies, aren't there? There's two credit bureau agencies. The first agency is called TransUnion. And TransUnion is a private company. And the second credit reporting agency is called Equifax. Equifax is also a private company. So a lot of people, they most likely know Equifax. That's the more popular one of the two. A lot of people think that the credit bureau reporting agencies is part of the government. And that's why I say, no, like these are private companies. 
the whole role of these companies is they take data from financial institutions or any institution that lends any form of credit, like including a cell phone company. And they take that data, they pop it into a series of different algorithms that their data scientists have built. And then they produce different data reports based on the collective information about you as an individual. Like, let's say you, Sean, say you have a mortgage with Scotia Bank, and you have a checking account with RBC, and then you have a cell phone with Rogers. Equifax or TransUnion is going to go to all those different places and collect all this data on you. Then they're going to produce the report and they have a series of different reports available that they sell. So they sell these reports to consumers, but they primarily sell these reports back to the financial institutions that they get the data from. Because let's say you're a Scotiabank customer and you went into Scotiabank to borrow more credit. Scotiabank's going to want to have a full view on all of your credit dealings. So if if it wasn't for Equifax or TransUnion or these agencies, Scotiabank wouldn't have the ability to go see like what your history was with RBC. No, that makes sense because the lenders want to make sure you're not overextended at other lenders before granting you credit. So that totally makes sense. Thanks for explaining that. Just uh, finally on this question here, could you perhaps explain why a good credit score matters in the context of getting a mortgage and getting the mortgage with the best terms? Yeah, for sure. So when you're shopping for a mortgage, you're going to apply, you're going to fill out an application, and that application is going to look at a few different things, as we know. What is your ability to make the mortgage payment? So in order to show that you have an ability to make the mortgage payments, you're going to need to show that you have some sort of income to pay that. And then another way that we show that we have the ability to make the mortgage payments is through our past credit history. So that credit bureau or credit report and that credit score will demonstrate your ability to make payments on time. So it's a huge considering factor when you are getting a mortgage. And because a mortgage is a secured loan, so it's secured against the property, the lender is not as strict about credit scores as they would be with an unsecured loan, but it still really does impact the type of mortgage that you can get. The way it works with mortgage, if you have a credit score over, I would say 650, just to be more conservative, anyone who has a credit score over 650 is probably going to get the same interest rates. However, if you have a credit score over 680, 700 range, you're going to be able to qualify for more mortgage. So it's not like a a higher credit score is going to get you a better rate if it's over 650, but a higher credit score will allow you to qualify for more mortgage because the lender is going to be more trusting about your ability to pay back versus like some unsecured loans. They really price the interest rate based on your credit score. So like someone who has a 680 credit score might pay a higher interest rate than someone with a 780 credit score, but it's not like that in the mortgage world. So I guess the bottom line is the higher the credit score, the better. Maybe aim for at least 700 to give yourself some buffer. Yeah, like you want to have a high credit score because it's just going to make your application go so much more smooth. Sounds good. Now, I've heard that Canadians are entitled to a free copy of their credit report once a year. How can we take advantage of that? Yeah, so this is true. You can get a free copy from Equifax or TransUnion. I don't really know what the current process is for it. I believe that you have to request it and they mail it to you. But thanks to technology, you can get your credit report online very quickly. Now, if you went to TransUnion or Equifax, you would have to pay to get that report. But in the last few years, we've seen some technology companies surface where they offer the credit report for free. These companies would be like Credit Karma, Mogo does it, RBC does it for their customers. Some of the banks are doing it now. So there are multiple ways to get your credit report for free. 
No, that's great to hear because certainly you don't want any surprises when you go to apply for a mortgage and credit that you paid off a year or several years ago is still showing as unpaid and you don't want that to be an issue when applying for a mortgage. So at least keeping a, a watchful eye on your credit and making sure that there's not any identity theft going on either, I think is an important thing to do, especially in this day and age. Yeah, that's probably one of the biggest reasons why we want to monitor our credit score is because like if you're about to go get a mortgage, you're all of a sudden entering an arena of like time sensitivity. What I mean by that is if you're buying a house, you're going to have certain deadlines that you need to hit. One of those deadlines is subject removal date. That's basically when you pay the deposit, you make the purchase firm, but in advance of that date, you need to have your mortgage all approved. Now, what happens if you go to get your mortgage application and you need that mortgage done in five days and you see something on your credit bureau absolutely does not belong to you, or maybe you paid it off, but it's still reporting on there and the lender is saying, sorry, we can't give you this mortgage money until this is handled. And then you have to call the credit bureau and it takes a really long time to get that taken off. And now this has just created a lot of stress for you within this arena of time sensitivity. This is one of the reasons why we want to monitor it on an ongoing basis, or at least like check like every couple months, like, okay, is everything on there that belongs to me? How is it looking? Like the maintenance of your credit report is important. Yeah, great point. Certainly you don't want any surprises at the 11th hour, that's for sure. And I'm sure you've seen that as a mortgage broker, Sean, because I certainly did when I was a broker. Yes, definitely. I can't speak about specific clients, but I had a situation where somebody had a similar name to my client and their unpaid cell phone bill was showing up on their credit report and that was causing an issue with the mortgage application. So certainly you want to keep a watchful eye and as well as it's a good idea to look at both the Equifax and TransUnion credit report because although they are most likely the same, that's not always the case. My understanding is that some of the lenders only report to one or or the other. Most of the time, they probably report to both of them, but sometimes your credit information can be different on either Equifax or TransUnion. So you want to keep an eye on both of them and monitor them on a regular basis. Yeah, absolutely. Seeing your credit report for the first time can be a bit intimidating. I know I certainly felt that way when I took a look at it. What are some things to focus on when reviewing your credit report? Yeah, let's like just take a second here to acknowledge that it is intimidating to look at your credit report the first time you see it. And those feelings are really normal. And I appreciate Shawnee bringing this up because we all experience those feelings of like, oh God, what am I going to see here? Or, or I don't understand this. Like, I don't feel like I'm very financially literate. And then shame arises. I think it's important to just like talk about that for a second and allow people who are listening to know that you are not alone when you're experiencing these feelings. So that said, when you do actually look at it, there's certain things that you want to look for. I would say the number one thing is you want to make sure that all of your credit vehicles and the payments are up to date. So do you have any credit cards or any loans where the payment is late? And if it's currently late, you want to make that payment right away so it's in good standing. The second thing you want to look at is what about the past history? How is it looking? Do I have any late payments in the past? I mean, if you do, there's not really anything you can do about it if you were actually late. But it'll give you some indication of like why your score is the way it is if you see late payments in the past. And as you monitor your credit score, you'll see like, let's say you had a 30 day late payment two years ago and your credit is strong, you're gonna see your score start improving. It's very important to know that the credit bureau is not looking so much at the dollar amount of things. Everything is based on time. If you are late on a $20 minimum credit card payment, that basically is equivalent to being late on a $250 payment in the eyes of the credit bureau. It's just all about time. So you really want to make sure like you never ever miss a minimum payment. Just do what you can to be on time. And sometimes I hear people say like, oh, this month I'm going to pay down $2,000 to my credit card. So next month I'm not going to make my payment. And that is not a good strategy. Like you never, ever want to miss a minimum payment. 
The next thing that is really important that you want to look for is what we call utilization ratio. So another thing that the credit bureau is really looking at is how much of your credit are you actually using? This utilization ratio is heavily applied to credit cards or lines of credits. And these products we call revolving credit, meaning it's kind of like if you have a balance, you might get stuck in the circle of debt because it's constantly revolving, meaning every single time you make a payment, you're allowed to re-advance that money and keep that balance going. With credit cards and lines of credits, if your utilization ratio is higher than 70%, what happens is the credit bureau algorithm goes into this like danger zone. Because if you are that close to your limit, past 70% was the amount that I said, it's just showing that you really need to like use the credit and it, it becomes more high risk. So that can substantially drop your score. About 30% of your credit score is based on utilization ratio. So one very quick way to increase your credit score is to lower the balances of all your credit cards and lines of credits to be below 70%. Your score should jump up within 30 to 45 days. And to be really good, you want to keep it below 35%. Great advice. Generally, I advise my mortgage clients to aim to be below 35%, but at least below 50%. As you mentioned, if you, when you get up into that 70% utilization area, it's like red alert to the lenders yeah. and it's certainly not doing any favors to your credit score. And that's not really common knowledge. A lot of people aren't aware of that. So it's, it's certainly an important point to really hammer home. Yeah. And especially like small business entrepreneurs or freelancers, sole proprietors who have their business credit card is linked to their personal name and reporting on their personal credit bureau. And maybe they're maxing their credit card out every single month for their business, yet they pay it off every month. If they pay it off after it gets reported to the bureau, it could show them almost maxed out, which would lower their score. So again, just always remember with the credit bureau, it's a timing game. Well, thanks so much for your insight into that, Chantel. And speaking of insight, I understand that you have a pretty interesting insight into the history of credit. So can you tell us why did humans even start using credit in the first place? Well, I don't know exactly like when and why the first use of credit for humans started, but one significant part of history within the realm of credit is just to kind of look at the times when we were really guided by theism, meaning religious beliefs and values kind of like dominated the way we lived our lives. And during that time, it was considered incredibly sinful to really like make more than what you need and to grow. Because if you had more, you were taking away from your neighbor. And that was considered to be a little bit sinful. And then when we encountered the scientific revolution, which was all about like progress and advancement and growth, that's when credit became a little bit more welcome. And there's this really famous economist named Adam Smith. He wrote this incredibly famous doctrine called the wealth of nations. And he basically stated that it's not that sinful to borrow money to advance yourself in the future. He actually said using credit is based on the assumption that our future resources are going to be far greater than our present resources. So if that's the case, then it's okay to borrow money in the present because in the future we'll be able to pay this back. When Adam Smith came out and said this, it kind of took away some of that like religious guilt around borrowing because what he was basically saying is if you borrow money and grow your business and create more wealth within your business, then you could hire people and there's actually like more of the pie to go around. So that's where we really kind of saw a big shift in the use of credit. Now, if we look at the way we use credit now, and then we look at what Adam Smith was getting at, I don't think that we're really using it in the way that he intended always. Buying a home, I think, is aligned with what Adam Smith was saying. I borrow money to advance myself in the future. 
right? Like that's what happens usually when you purchase an investment like real estate, you're borrowing from future resources because you don't have enough in the present, but you're doing it on the basis that there is a return of investment. Now, when we use our credit card to go out for dinner or to go shopping or to buy a pair of shoes, is that really aligned with what Adam Smith was saying? Probably not. Probably not, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I always like to kind of talk about like what really is the purpose of credit and to get people in the realm of their personal finances to think of their money and the way they use credit from a growth standpoint. Will me borrowing this money, is it going to enhance my future resources? So when I go to Nordstrom and I buy a pair of shoes, are these pair of shoes that I'm buying on credit going to enhance my future resources? Well, maybe if they're running shoes and I'm going to now run to work every day instead of take an Uber, yeah, you could argue that it might. But if I'm buying like a cute pair of high heels to wear out to dinner once, mm, probably not, right? I always tell my clients, like, look at your personal spending with, especially when you use credit from a ROI standpoint, return on investment. Now that's a great way to put it. Maybe I'll try that argument next time. My girlfriend wants to go and buy nice shoes, but uh, I'm <laughs> not sure how well that will go over. I guess we'll wait and see. <laughs> Perfect. So jumping back to the present now, you talked about revolving credit a bit earlier, but could you talk a bit about the different types of credit available, such as installments, mortgages, just briefly touch on those? Most credit is broken into two different categories, installment or revolving. So revolving meaning anytime you make a payment, you can reborrow it. So we kind of look at it as more of like a circle and it's easy to get stuck in that circle of debt. You can get a mortgage that is actually a revolving mortgage. So that would be considered a home equity line of credit. And then there is installment credit. So installment credit is where you borrow money and there's set terms that require you to pay back interest and in principal every single month. And you're not allowed to re-borrow what you pay back until the term is completed or you renegotiate the terms. When we're looking at someone who has a quite a bit of unsecured debt, we might say to them, you know, from a behavioral standpoint, it might make sense to transfer your revolving credit over to installments so this boundary is set for you where you actually aren't allowed to reborrow the money that you pay back. So we can see some light at the end of the tunnel for this debt for you. I guess it all comes down to the individual on how financially disciplined they are. But I guess if you ran into issues with revolving credit in, in the past, then that's when it can make sense to perhaps roll it into your mortgage and for yourself to pay it down. Exactly. Great. So you talked about one of the factors earlier, but I was wondering, Chantel, if you could talk about the five main factors that affect your credit score. You mentioned utilization or available credit, but if you could talk about the other four ones, then that would be great. Yeah. So when we're looking at the factors that really impact our credit score, payment history is number one. Number two is utilization ratio. We talked about both those things. Next, we're looking at types of credit. So types of credit would be like revolving versus installment. Another thing we're going to be looking at is length of credit. So how long have you had this credit history for? Because your report card is based on history, the longer you have credit, the stronger the history is going to be. The more the Bureau can make a case about your ability to pay or your ability not to pay. In the world of mortgages, we like to say there's this rule called the 222 rule. And basically what that means is mortgage lenders typically want to see at least two years of established credit history. They want to see at least two different credit vehicles on your Bureau. So do you have one credit card and maybe a car loan. They want to see that you can manage more than one piece of credit and they want to see that you can manage at least $2,000 in credit. So having like one credit card with a, a limit of 500 bucks, that's not going to be enough history for a mortgage lender. The next thing that you mentioned, Sean, was credit inquiries. This is an account, a record of who's checking your credit. So anytime you're out there shopping for credit, 
there's going to be a hit on your credit bureau and that hit will report as a credit inquiry. Another thing that's important to look for on your credit bureau are collections. This is when you owe money for a long period of time and you don't pay it and it can go into a collection. So this might be like a cell phone bill that you had a long time ago and you didn't pay or it could be parking tickets or different sort of like tickets that get sent to a collection agency and then it gets reported on the bureau. Great. Thanks so much for explaining all of those, Chantel. Let's just play a bit of a game for a moment. So let's play Mythbusters. I was just wondering if you could talk about some common misconceptions that you hear about credit scores. And I can certainly get you started with one or two. So one of the misconceptions I hear a lot is that I will hurt my own credit score by checking it. But that's incorrect, isn't it? Well, it's incorrect and it's not incorrect. Let's say you have a friend who is a mortgage broker or works at a bank and you're like, hey, can you check my credit score for me? That will hurt your credit score because that's considered a hard inquiry. Anytime it's like a lender or someone that you're borrowing money from, or even if it's like a leasing agent where you're going to go lease an apartment, that's typically a hard inquiry. So that can impact your credit score. But there's another type of inquiry called a soft inquiry. And this is when you go to Equifax or TransUnion or you go to Credit Karma or one of these places and you check your own score. This is considered a soft inquiry, so it doesn't actually impact your score. Great. Thanks for explaining that. And another common misconception that I hear out there is I'll improve my credit score by reducing my credit limit. But isn't that incorrect? Because if you're always going up to the maximum, couldn't that hurt your credit score more than help it? Yeah, this is a big one where people think like having a lower credit limit is better. But yeah, like if you max out your credit limit all the time and your utilization ratio is high, that will lower your score. But the thing is, is I'm going to argue here is if you don't trust yourself with a higher credit limit and you have the option between having a high utilization ratio or getting in debt at a larger amount, I would choose having a lower credit score and a higher utilization ratio than actually having the debt. So this is something you need to personally look at with your own behavior. Some of my clients, I say to them, you need to lower your credit card limit because we do not trust you with having this available limit. Yeah, definitely. I think it comes down to the individual and how financially disciplined they are because some individuals can handle a home equity line of credit while others will use it for vacations and other stuff that perhaps isn't the best use of it. So I certainly think that it comes down to the individual. Right. And I guess the last common thing that I hear is that, oh, it will improve my credit score by closing old credit accounts that I barely use like a credit card. But that's probably not a good idea since you have a good history with the lender more than likely, correct? Yeah, exactly. For oldest credit cards, don't close them because they help your history. Yeah, I guess perhaps if you're paying an annual fee that's excessive and you're not using it, then maybe the case can be had to close it. But yeah, certainly if you have an old credit card, I would say just try to use it like at least uh, once every two to three months just to avoid that inactive fee. But certainly don't close it if it's in good standing. Yeah, just look at your entire portfolio and say like, okay, well, do I have a few years of credit? Yeah, okay, I'm fine. Then I can close this card that I had for five years because I've got this other three years over here if it has a fee. So it's just, it's case by case basis. Just all you need to know is the longer the credit history, the better. No, I agree completely. I was just wondering, do you see any misconceptions out there that we haven't covered? And on top of that, what are some common credit mistakes that you see yourself, Chantel? I think a common mistake that I see, and Sean, you actually mentioned this, was just like getting multiple credit checks done, shopping around for credit and just being very promiscuous with the credit checks. That can impact your score. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. However, Equifax and TransUnion, they do have this rule that if you get checks done for mortgage or an auto loan in a specific period of time, multiple checks, it counts as one. However, some of the lenders that you can go to to get these checks, they might not be showing up with the Equifax or TransUnion as like the mortgage lender. Like say you went to the bank, it might just be like Scotiabank check versus 
is like Scotiabank Mortgage. So it could potentially impact your score. You just really want to be a little bit more cautious about how often your credit bureau is being checked. But you also want to be an educated and informed consumer too. So it's like play in between those two places of like not impacting your score, but still being educated and informed. And this is actually one of the benefits of working with a mortgage broker is mortgage brokers kind of act as that like in between you and the multiple financial institutions and they only use one credit bureau. They can kind of help you stay in that middle path of being the informed consumer and not having multiple checks. Great advice and you stole the words right out of my mouth. (laughs) (laughs) Guess great minds think alike. Exactly. Well, Chantel, what if your credit score isn't where you'd like it to be? What are your best tips for improving your credit score? Making sure all your payments are up to date and making sure your utilization ratios are below 70%. I like that short and sweet and certainly keep an eye on your credit report as well and try to fix any inaccuracies that you see and Equifax and TransUnion have information on doing that on their website there, but certainly staying on top of that is another important step as well. Yeah. And if that's not a good enough reason to want to improve your credit score, I've I've heard that a good credit score can also help with your love life. Is that true? (laughs) Well, I mean, I did a poll for this company called Mogo one year around Valentine's Day, and we did find that 67% of Canadian millennials said they'd choose a partner with a good credit score over good looks. That's what the data showed. (laughs) I think a good credit score, I mean, it's not a representation of someone being wealthy. I think it's a representation representation of someone being organized and responsible. And I mean, these are definitely qualities that I think I would look for in a partner. I think that poll makes sense. Chantel, it's been great having you again on the podcast. Before I let you go, you're working on a lot of great stuff, but what are you working on right now that the listeners would really love to hear about? Coming in September, I'm doing another cohort of my Mindful Money online course through my online school. And it's a seven module online course. We walk through basically ways to look at and heal your relationship with money. We go in depth around debt and credit score and and cash flow planning, which is basically like budgeting. And through that online course, you get to have a one-on-one session with me as well. Best way to find information about that is just to follow me on Instagram at at Chantel Chapman. And I'll be posting info about that. But there's also the link out to my online school's brand there too. And one more thing too is I've partnered up with a psychotherapist and we're producing a program called The Trauma of Money. And what we're we're going to be doing is we're going to be training financial professionals, mortgage brokers, financial advisors, and mental health professionals about our relationship with money on more of a psychological level. So this training is going to be starting late in fall. We've got an amazing faculty of teachers that are going to be teaching that program. It's really good for people who work in the finance world or the mental health world who just want to kind of deepen their understanding of like people's in interactions with money on this like deep psychological level. So that's coming out soon. And I think the best way to get information on that, again, same thing, just on my Instagram, I'll be talking about that too. Wow. Sounds like pretty fascinating stuff. And I'm sure the listeners would get some great value from checking that out. So be sure to follow Chantel on Instagram if you haven't already. Wonderful. Thanks again for being on the podcast. It was great to interview you once again. Thanks, Sean. So good to talk with you too. And thanks for doing this amazing podcast and teaching Canadians about freedom and money. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Burn Your Mortgage podcast. Besides being a podcast host, I'm also an independent mortgage broker. If you or anyone you know, family, friends, coworkers, or neighbors could ever use any unbiased mortgage advice or a second opinion, feel free to reach out. Email me at sean, that's S-E-A-N, at burnyourmortgage.ca or call or text me at 647-867-3711 for a free mortgage consultation. Also, be sure to head on over to www.burnyourmortgage.ca 
and sign up for my free weekly newsletter. As a small token of my appreciation, you'll be able to download my ultimate mortgage checklist on choosing the perfect mortgage. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you with all your mortgage needs. Once again, thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Burn Your Mortgage Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating. Until next time, happy mortgage burnings.